I remember several years ago, a doorbell rang. I went to the door, and there was a young man standing there. And uh, he said, I'm Mitch Walton. He said, uh, like the Waltons on television. I don't know if Mitch remembers that or not. But anyhow, I don't know if he's still trying or not, but he wanted some money. <laughs> You're fortunate to have Mitch here working with you. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity <clears throat> to be able to speak again. We're grateful for the visitors in the audience. If you're looking for a congregation to settle down in and to work, we would suggest that you consider Pyburn Street. She's been here a long time and a good congregation. <clears throat> the scripture which was read informs us that when God finished all of his work, you know, God works, uh, and he rests. He said after he had finished his work on the sixth day, why, God rested. Man needs to work, and he needs to rest. But when he had finished all of his work, <clears throat> of course, he looked out upon it, and he pronounced it very good, very good. Telephone rang the other night, and wife answered the phone, <clears throat> Brother Tao. And he wanted to know if I could come today and fill in for the sermon and work, and I suggested that I could. And so the next morning she said to me, she said, <clears throat> as she left the living room and passed into the dining room on the way to the kitchen. She said, what are you going to preach Sunday? I said, I don't know. Well, she proceeded to go on to the kitchen, and before she got into the kitchen, I said, I've decided I know what it is. She said, what is it? I said, I'm going to preach on good. She said, good. I said, yeah, I'm going to preach on good. Well, she said, uh, and I included uh, probably good and bad. Well, she said, how about the ugly? <laughs> you know, I've never preached on this word before. And uh, after I suggested to her that I would, and I told a few others I was going to preach on good, I didn't realize the work that would be involved in trying to get a sermon on that. But I've tried to put it together. <clears throat> you know, you can pass around our community here, and one can see some beautiful homes that people are building. And those men that are building those homes, I'm not talking about the man that pays for it, I'm talking about the man that builds them. When they get done with building those beautiful homes, I can imagine in my mind's eye that they take a step or two back when <clears throat> the last nail is driven, when the last faucet is placed in it, when the last bulb is put in the socket, and the last pane is put on the window. And when the key turns the lock to close the door, they step back and they look at that. They say it looks good. It's good. But these homes that these men are building with their calloused hands, 
They do not compare one bit with a beauty <clears throat> that God performed when he created this world in which we live. He pronounced it very good. And that was after he had created everything. Created uh, the universe. I don't know why that he made it as big as he did. A friend of mine <clears throat> wrote an article a few years ago in one of our publications. He raised a question in that article. He said, how big is God? <laughs> you ever give it that consideration? We are told that we don't know where the boundaries are that limits the expanse of this great universe in which we live. There had to be a supernatural being with powers untold he was able to do that. He pronounced it very good. The animals, the vegetation, birds of the air, they sang. The great fish in the waters and man. You know what was the last thing that he created? Mother Eve. She was the climax of all of that creation. And he said, <clears throat> very good, very good. A woman has a special place in all of God's creation. She was the stamp of approval for man and beast. And all of that went into the making of this great universe. Very good, he said. Are you pleased with what you've made? Has it been good? Has it been good? We should try <clears throat> to do good and to be good. That's what God expects of us. We can't do that <clears throat> unless we let our light shine Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, that it might give light unto all that are in the house. We are the light of the world. I don't like to live in darkness. Neither do you except you've done something bad, and I might preach on bad tonight. Why is it that a man, when he wants to do something bad, like going and getting him a shot of whiskey, he looks down the street and he finds the darkest tavern he can find to go into where the lights are down low. And when he goes in, he finds the darkest corner he can get in to sip on the devil's brew. Why does a man do that? He's shamed, doesn't want to be seen. He knows he shouldn't be there, but I'm not speaking on bad right now. I want to talk about good. And so we are the light of the world. We are a city set on a hill. It cannot be hid. The word good is used as an adjective in the Bible, in the, New, in the New Testament. The word good is used as a noun in the New Testament. And the word good is used as a verb in the New Testament. And it's very interesting, of course, to make a study along that line. Considering it as an adjective, we would recognize that the word good is beneficial in its effect. If we happen to enjoy something that 
has been the effect of something, that which produced it is good. Good. Has to do with physical things. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 17, he talked about the tree, the good tree. What does it do? It produces good fruit. Good fruit. So Jesus in this roundabout way, he suggests that we are like a tree and that we are to produce good fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 17. Jesus talked about the good ground in Luke chapter 8 and verse 8. The good ground. We live in a rural area. A lot of farmers live round about. <clears throat> when I was a boy, farmers were just about in every 40 acres of land. If a man had 40 acres and a good team of mules and about a 14 Oliver breaking plow, why, he could plow two acres a day if he'd step on it. He could plow about two acres a day and he could make a living. And he's pretty pleased if the ground was good. But if the ground wasn't good, <clears throat> of course, he sometimes had to suffer and go down to the bank and borrow money to put in the next crop and to buy shoes for the children. I remember here in Pocahontas coming to town on a Saturday and folks buying mothers and daddy buying shoes for their children because a cotton has been picked. And we've been down and we've sold a bale of cotton. If we made one bale per acre, that was wonderful. We could get through. 500 pounds of seedless cotton makes a pretty good bale. Well, <clears throat> that's good because he's farming good ground. And so Jesus talked about the good ground that brought forth abundantly a hundredfold. And that's the kind of people that we should be, the kind of people that are good, that can produce something that will be helpful for others. Another thing that we think about the good as it's used in an adjective, it's used in the moral sense. Not only in the physical things, such as trees and earth, but also moral things. For instance, in Luke chapter 18 and verse 19, somebody asked Jesus about the good man. He said, <clears throat> Only God is good. God is good. Talking about the morality of God. And when the church in Jerusalem heard about the church in Antioch and how that the church at Antioch was growing and this was the mother church of the Gentiles. And you have there the mother church of the Jews. And now then the church at Antioch. And a friend, good friend of mine, we were discussing that the other day. What Antioch was that? Phrygia or Syria? Do you know? Have you given it consideration which one of those cities that Jerusalem sent this man to to work with the members. Well, we decided that it was in Syria, Antioch of Syria. And it became the mother church of the Gentiles. This is where Paul went out on his first missionary journeys to convert the Gentiles in the Roman world. 
But when the church in Jerusalem, which was made up of Jews, when they heard about the church at Antioch, they sent Barnabas up there. You talk about congregational cooperation and spiritual things, here it is. They sent Barnabas up there to work with the church at Antioch. And when Barnabas got up there, he saw the need of such a work that he decided he'd go get Saul, the converted Saul, who was over at Tarsus. I guess he's visiting with his parents over there, his family, I don't know. But Barnabas decided to go over there and get Paul or Saul to come back and work with him. He, his name had not been changed yet. It wasn't changed until he got on his first missionary journey, and then he began to be called Paul. And someone said, why did they change the name of Paul or from Saul to Paul? Well, I was told <clears throat> that the word Saul was the Hebrew connection, And the word Paul is the Greek connection, the Gentile. And so since Saul was going to be working with the Gentiles, then they changed his name to Paul. And so Saul went over, or Paul, Barnabas went over to to Tarsus and got Saul and he came back and they worked together there for a whole year. And then the Holy Spirit called them and uh, to send them out on a great missionary journey. And it describes a Barnabas as being a man full of the Spirit, and he was a good man. He was a good man, Barnabas. He was a great exhorter. That's uh, an ability that some preachers have that I don't have. I'm not a great exhorter. I remember Brother Bradfield going all over the country, all over the brotherhood, and back in the 50s, he would preach, and the aisles would just be flocking with people that would come down. And they wanted to obey the gospel. Brother Bradfield was a great exhorter, and a few others that lived during his day. Well, Barnabas was one of those fellows, and he was a good man. The Bible informs us that he was. Acts 11 and verse 24. Then another passage is used dealing with good people. And it has to do with young wives and mothers. You know, that's one of the greatest things that we need in our day. Good wives and good mothers. There's not a greater responsibility that placed upon the shoulders of a woman than for her to be a good wife and to be a good woman. When Paul wrote to Titus, chapter 2 and verse 5, he says that the older women, now you ladies here that I've been around for a few years, and I can tell who you are because you're white-haired. you got white hairs on your head. Well, here <clears throat> Paul talks to you through the writings of Titus. And he said <clears throat> that the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior to be cometh holiness, not false accusers. Don't go out and accuse somebody. <laughs> That's not the truth. Sometimes, you know, when ladies get kind of elderly and they don't have a whole lot to do, the grandkids are not around, you, you don't have to watch them. The kids are all gone. And the husband, he's too old to do anything. He's sitting out somewhere under a shade tree waiting for, you know, like that, television program waiting for God we wait for God when we get gray headed that's what we're doing that's what the television says but anyhow here's Paul writing to the aged women that she is to 
becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine. Don't sip on it too long. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. And uh, teachers are good things. If you're going to teach something, make it good. Don't make it bad. Teach good things. Well, <clears throat> that they may teach the young women. I remember G.K. Wallace. You all might have heard him preach. He's a cousin to 4E Wallace, the old white-headed man. G.K. is talking about, this has been several years ago. He was talking about the counselors that congregations were hiring at that time. All they were supposed to do, these counselors, were when the young women get family troubles, maybe their husbands step out or something. You know, a husband steps out once in a while. He steps in places that he shouldn't. And uh, he gets a wandering eye. And the first thing you know, he has wandering hands. Well, that causes trouble for the young wife. And she needs some help. And uh, congregations began to hire counselors just to take care of that. G.K. Wallace said, send her to grandma. Does that make sense to you? Grandma's been down the road. She might have experienced some of the same things when she was a young woman. Send her to grandma. And so here, Titus, Paul is writing to Titus. And he says <clears throat> that she is to teach the younger women, the young women, to be sober to love their husbands. You know, a woman, a young woman can lose sight of her husband just like sometimes the man can lose sight of his wife. And the, the young wife gets a roving eye. <laughs> that ought not so to be. That's one of the great problems that we have today. You have any divorce cases? You having problem along that line? Somebody had a roving eye and caused much trouble. And one of the greatest miseries that a young husband or a young wife can ever face, those kind of conditions. Now, older women have a responsibility to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. I wonder today if young mothers love their children like your mother loved you. What are happening to the young children today? What's happening to them? Well, <clears throat> seemingly they're not getting the attention from mother that your mother gave to you in the long go, days gone by. Thus, teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good. There's that word I'm talking about. You're to be good. Obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, when you see families fussing and fighting, and, and especially young wives that are giving her husband down the line out here in the country where people are gathered around, seeing all of the commotion, what do the people think about that? Here are people supposed to be members of the church and what have you, and they're out here in the public fighting, and the young woman is just beating her husband up. <laughs> well, the word of God blasphemed in a condition like that. 
So the young, older women are to teach the younger women to be good, to be good. Well, we would recognize that Christ is said to be good in the Scriptures. In John 7 and verse 12, Jesus was very active in His work, and uh, people were watching Him, of course. And some said that Jesus was a good man. You know what others were saying about Him? They said, He's a deceiver. Well, if Jesus was a deceiver, He's the greatest deceiver that the world has ever known. Seemingly, taking this particular passage under consideration, one can be the Son of God Himself, and yet people will criticize Him. They did the Lord. Some said He was good. Others said He is a deceiver. A deceiver. Well, this word good is used as an adjective in a general way. We've been somewhat specific with it. The physical things, the trees, the ground, and then the moral sense. And then in a general application, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, we are told that God causes it to rain on the good or the evil and the good. God does not discriminate. You have two farmers here. This farmer owns this section of land, this man owns this section of land, and here this fellow is a member of the church, and this fellow over here is not a member of the church, not a Christian, and <clears throat> comes up a cloud of rain, and both of them need, a, need a, a good rain on their crop, need a good rain. Well, what does God do? Well, he doesn't say, I'm going to cause it to rain on the Christian. I'm going to forget this fellow over here. No. God causes it to rain on a general way on the evil and on the good. The Bible says that. So we believe it. So God is good in that particular matter. And then in Romans chapter 5 and verse 7 we are told about the righteous man and the good man. I asked a fella one time, we were out and we were hauling hay. I said to him, I said, Bill, do you know the difference between a righteous man and a good man? Well, he said, Ben, I don't think I do. I said, well, a righteous man <clears throat> will give you everything that he's compelled to do. If you're buying a pound of beans from him, he'll put it on the scales, and if there's one bean there that's too heavy, he'll take that one bean out because he wants to make it, make it just right. If it likes one bean, he'll put one in it. He's a righteous man. Well, what's a good man? Well, a good man will not only give you what you've asked for, but a little more. A little more. So we might take that under consideration in Romans chapter 5 and verse 7. Well, we are told that Christians are to prove all things. And uh, the benefit that comes from this particular matter of proving that you are a good person, we find that by the life that we live, Paul, when he writes to the Romans in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he talks about that particular matter. And uh, I believe my time is gone. Uh, he said in this passage, and we'll be closing, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, 
in your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, you may prove what is that good and profitable and perfect will of God. If you're here today, should like to obey the gospel, we invite you to come. While together we stand and while we sing.